So why are wood joints used? The short answer is to avoid gluing to end grain. Glue sticks very well to face grain and to edge grain, but not to end grain. So instead of gluing to end grain, designers find ways of gluing the sides of timber together. Overlapping two pieces of timber like this makes a stronger joint, but the parts are not flush. A better solution is to remove half the thickness of each piece of timber so that the parts are flush when they're assembled. This joint is called a corner halving joint. An even stronger solution is when the parts stay together without using glue. One example is the mortise and tenon joint. So as you watch the animations of the following wood joints, remember that they've all been designed to avoid the need to rely on the strength of glued end grain to hold the parts together. The butt joint is the simplest and weakest joint. You have seen that glue into end grain does not form a strong joint, so nails and screws are used to give this joint its minimal strength. And here's an example. The backs of drawers are sometimes glued and pinned to the drawer sides in order to form a weak joint. This is useful if the drawer is too full and gets jammed. The drawer can still be forced open if the back of the drawer comes off and the jammed contents can slide off the drawer base. The lapped joint, also called a rebated joint, is a little stronger than a butt joint, particularly when pressure is applied in the direction of the rebate shoulder. However, the joint still involves gluing to end grain. The tongue and groove joint has plenty of gluing area, but most of the gluing area is end grain. It is most commonly used in staircase construction where most of the strength of the joint comes from the beams supporting the timber steps. This joint is called the finger joint or comb joint. It has plenty of glue area on the edge grain of both pieces of timber so it forms a very strong glued joint. And here's an example. The finger joint or comb joint is a little easier to make than a dovetail joint so it is sometimes used instead of the stronger dovetail joint. The dovetail joint is a powerful joint that is used to fix draw fronts to draw sides. The wedge-shaped dovetails cannot be pulled out of the tail sockets. And here's an example. The lap dovetail joint is simply a dovetail joint with shorter tails. The joint is most often used to join draw sides to draw fronts. The ends of the dovetails are hidden, giving the draw fronts a neater look. And here's an example. The housing joint involves gluing to end grain. So the strength of the joint comes from the shoulders of the groove that supports the piece of timber in it. And here's an example. The corner bridle joint is a mechanical joint as well as a glue joint. It has plenty of gluing area on the timber faces, so it is a quick way of producing a strong joint. Similarly, the T bridle joint is also a mechanical joint as well as a glued joint. It also has plenty of gluing area on the timber faces and can be easily made using a tenon saw and a chisel. The front of the mitered corner bridle joint has the look of a mitered joint, but the back is like a bridle joint, so the extra glue in area strengthens the joint. The mortise and tenon joint is a very strong joint with plenty of gluing area on the timber sides. It is used in frame structures like door frames, table and chair frames. Remember, the mortise is the rectangular hole cut with a mortise chisel, and the tenon is the rectangular pin cut with a tenon saw. And here's an example. The haunched mortise and tenon joint is used in frame structures that have a groove in the frame used to hold a timber panel. The haunch fills the end of the groove which results in a better looking finished product. And here's an example. The stopped mortise and tenon is another variation on the mortise and tenon joint. 
This joint has the advantage of hiding the mortise and tenon, which results in a strong joint without evidence of how the parts were fixed together. This joint is most often used in wooden table and chair construction. The bare face tenon is used when a tenon must be cut on a narrow piece of timber and there's not enough width in the timber for shoulders on all sides. So to maintain the width of the tenon, one of the shoulders is left off. The dowel joint is quick and easy to produce and is almost as strong as a mortise and tenon joint. The holes for the dowels are drilled using a doweling jig to ensure that the holes in both parts to be joined line up. And here's an example. The corner halving joint is a quick method of overcoming the problem of gluing to end grain. It does not form a strong mechanical joint, but is useful for non-structural applications, particularly where the parts may be fixed to something else that will support them. And here's an example. The T halving joint is slightly stronger as the sides of one part are supported by the shoulders of the other. The dovetail halving is stronger still. The shape of the dovetail can resist pulling forces even without glue. The cross halving joint involves gluing to end grain, but still forms a fairly strong mechanical joint. It is used in frame structures where two parts of a frame cross but have to remain flush. The mitre joint consists of two lengths of timber that are butted together. The end of each piece of timber is cut to half of the internal angle of the joint pieces. That is, if the internal angle is 90 degrees, then the end of each piece of timber is cut at an angle of 45 degrees. The joint involves gluing to end grain, so it should be strengthened in this case by using dowels. And here's an example. In this example, the internal angle of the joint pieces is 120 degrees, so the end of each piece of timber is cut at an angle of 60 degrees. To strengthen the joint, a biscuit is glued into slots in the mitered ends. And here's an example. Finally, a word about wood glue. Wood glue is often designated as being D1, D2, D3 or D4 adhesive. The D stands for durability. Basically, D1 is the least durable adhesive and cannot stand exterior damp or wet conditions, while D4 can. So any glued product that will be kept outside should be made using either D3 or D4 adhesive.